thank you everybody for being here. This is the last Kribo before we take a short August break for some holidays, but we will resume in mid-September. And after all these seminars, all these Kribo seminars that we've had, I think this is the seventh, I think it's time to take stock of what we have tried to offer as Inscribe. This series of seminar was meant to be held live in Bologna, and this is why the name Scribo has Bo at the end, because it was supposed to be welcome, welcoming all of you who could make it live in Italy, live in Bologna, and our great speakers. But the pandemic has had, unfortunately, as you all know, a different idea. And we could have let this series go, we could have resorted to doing nothing, but we decided to master the technicalities of Zoom and to transpose everything that we do online as everybody that does research has had to resort to doing. And our hope was that we would have a wide enough audience through this platform. And little did we know that it would become the success that it has become. We've always had a very wide audience with very lively and long and intense and rich discussions at the end and with great speakers for every single seminar, no exception. The quality has been astoundingly splendid. And so we at Inscribe, on behalf of all of the team that I direct, we're so very grateful that so many of you had followed us this far. And we're also grateful to our great speakers Ignacia Diego, Judith Van Garden, Massimo Cultaro, Philippe Steele, John Baines, Wilhelmine Val, and today, our latest, Christian Praga, whom I'm meeting today for the first time. And in this series, we've talked about the cipherment, about early scripts from all over the world, the Aegean, Egypt, China, Cyprus, the early Greek alphabet. And today we venture into crossing over the pond to end up in Mesoamerica with the Maya. So we have striven to give you a truly global perspective. And we can only hope that our series from September will be as rich and as wonderfully intense and diverse. And I'm sure that with all our efforts and possibly in a more hopeful horizon looking ahead, we will manage to offer as much. So we will resume on the 16th of September with Genevieve von Kretzinger and we will go deep into the deepest origins of symbols because she will be treating the abstract symbols on Paleolithic rock art. But without any need for me to babble more, our great guest today, Dr. Christian Prager from Bonn University, where he is coordinator of the text, database, and dictionary of classic Maya. I'm not going to say that in German, if you don't mind. <laughs> you could say it when you present and introduce what you do. This project was funded in 2014 by its director, Nicolai Gruber, and it aims to create an interdisciplinary platform and dictionary of classic Maya by analyzing incredible all known texts written in this script, written in Maya. So you can imagine a gigantic project with this open-ended view through interdisciplinarity, epigraphy, archaeology, you name it. I cannot wait to hear more. So Christian, over to you, the study of Maya hieroglyphic writing in the digital age. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for your kind, very kind. Of, um... Uh, introduction and I hope that I can keep up with the quality that you already have in your, in your talks during the seminar. So you can see it? Yes, in the first fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So again, welcome and thanks again for giving me the opportunity to present our, our project that is running now since 2014. And we aim to, to, to run it until 2028 to 20, 2029. And I give you here some um, some of the key facts about the project. You see, it's funded by the North Rhine-Westphalian Academy of Sciences, Humanities and the Arts, and the Union of the German Academics of Sciences and Humanities. And 
It's also funded by the University of Bonn and our cooperating partner is the Göttingen State and University Library, who is um, responsible for the IT technology and for the information technology. And uh, you already gave a very good um, summary of the project. It's written again here, it's a compilation of a text database and dictionary of classic Mayan. And when we were applying for the project, we thought there are about 10,000 ancient Maya hieroglyphic texts. Of course, there are more. So it's something that it's difficult to make, to, to see, to, 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 to have it, um, to, to get a compilation of all the texts. And that's part of our project that um, we, we gather a list of all known hieroglyphic texts, put them in a database with images on, and other forms of representations. Right now we have gathered about 3000 um, texts, but we haven't deciphered yet. So it's just, uh, we put them in a database, um, put on, uh, compared to the, the metadata and so on. And the texts that we have right now, are the, the 10,000 texts that are about, uh, available, date between 500 and 1500. And you see in, in, the mean, in the meantime, we have information that there are about 600 archeological sites in Southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize and Honduras that have hieroglyphic inscriptions. And you see here some of the, the dictionary, Maya dictionary website you can find um, by following this link. And before I, before I just let me, Yes, before I start, I, um, I want to show you some of the visible things of our project. The thing is now, although we already have six years in, in, in the running or in, in the project, um, we have many things in the background that, you, that, you, that, that is not visible at the moment. It's the database that we are running with TextGrid, Daria. And, but the most important thing at the beginning of the project was to, come, to put up a website. It's here, it's text, datenbank, and Wörterbuch des klassischen Maya, the German um, spelling of what you, um, um, what you had, what you uh, talk, talked before. And on that website, we publish recent decipherments, we publish reports, we publish um, um, documentations, and so on. It's, 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 all the articles published here are, are, have a DOI, uh, uh, and, and DOI number, they are officially re re registered. And as part, for example, here as part of the dictionary project, we had to compile lists of archaeological sites. We compiled a list of museums and collections that host Maya objects. And now it has over 227 um, um, ele elements in there. So you have a quite good overview of all the museums and collections that have that, that possess Maya objects or exhibit Maya objects, or at least have collections um, of photographic, photographic collections. And one part that has um, had been added to the database in 2018 is an image archive. It now consists of, you see it here, 12,740 media, mean, Im meaning images, Many of them come from the archives of a fellow and um, co of a colleague of us, Carl Herbert Meyer, who has been visiting the, the, the Mexico, Guatemala um, in, in the, since the 1970s. And he shared all, is sharing all his, his archive of about 40,000 images. And at the moment we started to, um, uh, to compile his, um, his, his archive put in the, we put together the metadata and the, and the, and the very co cool thing for us or for the research is that this is an open access database, meaning all the images down, all the Im images that we upload um, are, um, have the Creative Commons um, license CC BY 4.0, or most of them. Meaning that you don't need to ask anymore, can I use this image? or can I cite this image, just download it and use it and cite it. That's the, that's the thing. And as you can see it here, we, we have organized it in several um, entities. It's, it's compiled of artifacts, collections, meaning we also compile um, archive, archival materials from museums, from archives. We share them 
And of course, we observe the, the copyright in statements that are available. Many American um, museums, for example, um, share their material freely. It's, it's public domain. And, that's, and, and when something is public domain, you can use it. And we did it. So, but I'm going to show you in, in, in a while what we are going to do this. And this is an image database. And it, here's an, here, for example, is an, a detailed example here, Dos Pilas. Um, and for example, on the left side, we have recently uploaded all the images of the Ushul archaeological project, just the in inscriptions. So you can download it. You can up, um, we have uh, descriptive uh, metadata. So it's a, it's, a, it's a platform to share, to compile images for artifacts. So we, we don't, we, we simply not, on, we're not only using images by Carl Herbert Mayer. For example, going back here, our, our, our partner, project partner, Ivan Spreitsch from Ljubljana is also sharing his, his, his great archive of my hieroglyphic texts that he found since 1998, sharing it with the CC BY license, which is very kind of him. And also sharing all the Octavio Esparza O'Keen's drawings. They, will, they are online, they can be used and they can be cited. And this is one of the, uh, one, one of the aims of the project to compile um, all available images that are freely accessible and freely distributable. And we also do, um, this might be interesting for some of you, um, we do 3D scanning here from, on the right side using image of our Breutmann scanner, white light structured um, um, scanner, here scanning a, a hieroglyphic text on a, on a ceramic vessel that is in a, from a museum in Cologne. Uh, we use the platform Sketchfab it's the, the, the best way to publish material. Um, and we, so far we, we have uh, compiled about 200 Maya artifacts, but at the moment we just um, um, published about 50. Uh, because it takes some time to process them and, to, and so on it, and to ask permission, for, especially to ask for permission. But this is also part of the project, the documentation of my hieroglyphic text now in museums. Um, next week, I'm going to, to Cologne and going to scan Stila 89 from Kalakmul, which is now an exhibit in, 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 in a German museum here in Bonn. And another thing that is visible right now is a database for literature on the, on the, on the Maya. Now it has over 30,000 entries. It's online since today. You, you see the link open there. It's, a, it's Zotero, it's run with Zotero, idiom, um, bibliography, and you can simply use it. We have now 30, about 30,770 entries. It's everything about Maya, from biology, from linguistics, from epigraphy, from everything that has to do with Maya culture. And it's quite, a, it's, it's, this is something that it was, it is part of the project. We do, we are running this um, Sotero database until the end of the project, which will then, I guess, cont uh, compl contain about 60 to 100,000 um, entries just for uh, literature on the classic Maya. And the advantage is, for example, that most of the articles are linked to databases. So you can double click them and you, you can directly go to the article that is shown here. And you have a quite good um, export mechanisms. So those of you who are using this database or who are using Sotero know the advantages of Sotero. We can easily share the, the contents and so on. That's something that is visible right now. Something that will be soon visible is, uh, is a new tool that we are recently developing for Maya calendar calculations. This is a part of it. As, as you can see, the new thing is here. And that's a new calendar tool that we are currently programming. And the difference to other known uh, calendar tool is that you can work with ranges and spans of information. I have put in here an example. For example, if you have a calendar inscription that, has, that, is, um, that is unknown, this is uh, with an asterisk, then, then you can enter a number um, ranges from so on, so on, so on. Or for example, the day name is something, but the day coefficient is four to seven, something in between four to seven. And then it calculates all the possible um, solutions. 
And you also can change the correlation constant um, to whatever you want. So this is part of it. And the other new and the, the thing that, uh, that we are currently doing and, and will be uploading soon is a, a Maya calendar calculations for distance numbers. Numbers. For those of you working with hieroglyphic inscriptions, you know that it's often impossible to, to um, calculate, um, let's say, um, unreadable hieroglyphic texts that where you only can see some coefficients, just maybe this day sign or that day sign or this one. And we, we, we um, created a, a calculator for distance numbers where you can, for example, um, enter multiple numerical values as a range, separate it with a comma, you com combine the information, and the full variables, and so on and so on. And this helps us to reconstruct um, hieroglyphic texts or the, the calendar structure of hieroglyphic te texts, which are almost unreadable. And it works quite good, I must say. I, um, I worked on longer um, uh, on hieroglyphic inscriptions. And for example, you see here this plus here, it means that you can add distance number at the beginning or distance number at the end. So um, this is something that we have developed in the past um, six months. And one of the advantages is that we can export the results. Here's a screenshot that you can export the exa examples at the results in an Excel sheet as a text file. You can have it as a PDF, um, OTS, and so on. And you simply can um, copy paste it and use it. So this is something we will upload within the next few weeks. And this is, a, this is something that is visible soon. And next, next thing to be visible, which is visible soon, is our digital catalog of Maya hieroglyphs. And this is our, our hieroglyphic database um, is based on the Thompson catalog. We had, we, um, in, in the, in the past um, 70 years, or 80 years, 12 different catalogs have been published. One of them is Eric Thompson's um, famous um, catalog of Maya hieroglyphic signs. He then um, um, compiled 860 signs in his catalog. And for our project, we decided that we will continue his, numer his numer numerical system because it's like, if you don't use um, Thompson, it's like giving up Gardiner. So if, if you would, so it's the Gardiner for, for uh, Maya studies. You don't give up a system which is well and, um, and established. It has many mistakes in there, although. So our aim was in the past um, three years to co make corrections and new drawings. What you have here is a list, is a, is a, is a list of all the, um, 882 graphs that I drew the past three years. And we have, um, we have uh, excluded those numbers which are double or mistaken. And now at the moment, our revision shows that his catalog of 806 designs has, has only 509 signs, including newly classified signs. And of course, in the course of the, of the, of the project, we will add new um, hieroglyphic signs which are not included in the in the, in, the, in this in the old in the old Thompson catalog, and one thing that I can show you right now is this statistics. We always are being asked how much of the Maya writing is deciphered. I can answer it now very clearly. And in our, according to our our catalog, um, we have um, two hundred forty three matches for logographs and one hundred thirty thirty three matches for. Um, for phonetic signs. You see it here, these are my drawings here, or these are with, and, and of course this is a part of, of a teamwork, it's not my thing, it's just, it's, just, it's, 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 it's in a, such a project you can, you are not working alone, you have a good team behind you that are supporting you and that are um, keen on working on, this, on these texts. And as you can see it here, in a to we have a total of 509 signs in the database, and 243 are deciphered morphographs, 130 syllabographs, which means that 376 signs are not deciphered. Um, are deciphered. Undeciphered signs are 133. And we also introduced some kind of um, plausibility test for the readings. I will show it to you later how it works. 
and 260 signs of the deciphered signs have the highest possibility plausibility which gives a 69 percent and you can read it here and so now the statistic proves that we at the moment can only read 51 percent of the scripts sign inventory with signs that that have the highest confidence level and if you if you don't if you don't uh, regard this confidence level, you can say it's 75, 74% of all the signs in my writing system have a reading, have a bad reading, have a good reading, have a plausible reading, something else. But at the moment we can say that, that my writing is simply deciphered in a, for a simply, that simply 51% of the script is deciphered. This is quite new and this is, a new information that I can provide in, in the context of this um, conference here. And this is the back. And now comes some elements that will be what we will be preparing in the past, in the, in the coming months and years. It's the portal. The website will be replaced by this portal, which is then the, the, the landing page to go into the sign catalog, the text corpus, the Maya dictionary, which is far, far, far away at the moment. And my history project, we include there, for example, Peter Matthews' database that he that he's, gave us in 2014, which we are currently working into our database system. The calendar tool that I show you will be online very soon. The image database is there, the 3D models are there, and the bibliography are there. So we, we will compile all these um, different elements of the database via this um, portal. All the database is, 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 um, is created with the help of TechScript. This is the uh, virtual research environment which is used to uh, work with TI or XML, or XML um, um, documents or T XML TI coded resources, as you can read on, on there. This, um, this is a decision that has been done, uh, done uh, years ago and um, it was a good hint by my colleague Frau Sachse in 2013 when we uh, applied for the for the uh, for the for the project. Why don't you use um, TechSpread? And now it's there, and we are using it, and we are happy with this decision. It looks like this. It's it's it's, it's part of the TechSpread environment is now this. Um, um, this this doc uh, this mask entry mask which we are using to enter information on the artifact on activities um, the database we are using is a so called graph day graph based RDF database based on CDOC CRM um, um, semantic uh, architecture as you can see it here we document artifact activities acquisitions events the acquisition of of monuments, of vases, and so on, custody, uh, and so on. And we also have a huge uh, a database for epigraphic actors that are all those people, kings, gods, persons named in the hieroglyphic, in, in the hieroglyphic texts. Of course, the same with places and so on. And in the same infrastructure, we document the sign and graphs of my hieroglyphic writing. And for those of you who are familiar who is or are, are familiar with um, RDF and databases. Um, it looks like this in the background. So uh, this is an artifact from Rio Michol. And we, we introduced a preferred title, the Rio Michol Miscellaneous Text 1. And as you can see, there is an alternative title, RMC MSC1, which is the abbreviation for this. The advantage of using this kind of database is that you can add as many alternative designations for an object as you want. If there, for example, this, this, this inscription is called um, blah, 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 you can enter it as idiom title or idiom type alternative and so on. And for those of you know this, um, these, these abbreviations here, this is the CDOC CRM element P102, P41. And as you can see, this allows us to use um, semantic um, data or semantic databases or um, to put in order to put our information in the linked open data uh, world and as you can see here we add we add some information on the 
on the dimensions. And this is just an, an ex excerpt. This is not complete. And of course, we also can add here the bibliographic information. You see it here from Heinrich Berlin, news from the Meyer world. This, has been, this is directly linked with our Sotero database. So these, these databases are all linked together. And when you can see it here, idiom was found at, then you add here the resource, the URI of the place name. And the place here is, uh, um, is here Rio Machol. So in order to, um, to, to compile information about artifacts, what we do, we, we, we work with artifact, then we link it with place, then we could link it with, 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 with for discovery. For example, when the, when the artifact is being discovered by so-and-so, we can link it with the artifact or with place. Or it's, a, it's a graph database that is quite useful to work with this. We also use um, controlled vocabularies. We use Workbench as an open source, or open access and open source um, tool. It now has 2,200 entries and the, and the scheme, the schema, you see it here. We have controlled voc vocabularies for activity types actor appellations, artifact orientation, artifact type, conditions. And recently we added here a uh, um, graph icon, which is the, for the description of the Maya hieroglyphic signs, because my hieroglyphic writing is iconic. And in order to describe all the iconographic elements for my hieroglyphic writing, we, use, uh, we introduced this um, graph icon element, which is our our, and this is the, uh, an, a, an example how it looks in the workbench dictionary. For example, the Stela is called here La Cantun. It's called in, in, in English, it's Stela, Estela is Espanol. And on the right side, you see the, the, the entry mask. You can for, add, for example, here, um, Scott's preferred label, Stela, La Cantun. This is something that has the, uh, entered. Um, Elizabeth Wagner, who is responsible for this um, workbench dictionary. You can add as many um, f um, in, um, languages as you want. And the most important thing is that you can connect it with the AAT, um, the Getty dictionaries. It's not shown here, but you can do it. So it's a nice tool to work, to compile com um, dictionaries for, or control the vocabularies for this kind of work we are doing. And another important element for um, the work is here the text image link editor for of um, TextGrid. It allows you see here on the top you see here Monum um, um, Lintel 8 fr um, from Yashilan here with some markings and it means that you can connect the XML document with um, elements in the iconography. For example, uh, um, this is a hieroglyphic inscription in blue, and you can connect this image part with the, with the XML um, here. It means that if you want, for example, um, uh, have just the image of the, of the, of the, of the verb here, chukach, which you can, you can see it's quite eroded, you can connect this to the XML, and you can, can, you can cut out and crop out the specific image here. So uh, the aim of the dictionary is that we not only give um, pure transliteration, those translations of the text, you want to depict the original inscription. And that's, and, and with the help of this text image link editor of TextRit, we can um, quite easily produce a dictionary of transliterations and original depictions. Let's go now to, let's work now with an example. I have here, cho I've chosen a, a lintel 16 from Yashilan with a very nice and very good drawing by Ian Graham. I, it's, 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 for those of you um, um, using this PowerPoint, I must mention that some of the images are copyrighted. The Harvard, Harvard archives are copyrighted materials. It's, it's, it's great material just to let you know um, that you cannot even just, uh, cut out and paste it somewhere else. So I, 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 will, I will sometimes say that it's a copyrighted image. On the right side, you see our 3D scan of a plaster cast that we scanned in Cambridge, um, UK uh, in 2017. And you, you get an impression how, this, how the relief, relief, relief um, of the monument is and so on. And 
to give you some 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 impression, what's 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 the iconography, what's the text? I can give you a short um, transliteration translation of the text. In green, you see here the green the green text field says six um, um, six cup can halau chukaf yash something cup and uh, you can read it from yourself. On February 11, 752, captured is yash question mark talk. The question mark is 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 here simply used um, because we cannot redesign at the moment. Here's from Wakap, he's a subordinate of Pi. The next text field gives Pi Lakamchak, king of Wakap. And uh, the third text field is can be read as Yechte Ush Katun. Now how the cartoon is in, in brackets because we cannot read the, the specific word for um, for this time period. It's, um, some colleagues think it's we need cup. Personally, there is no, I think there is no evidence for, there's no good evidence for this we need cup. So we are still using some nicknames um, in, for that. We can, we can, in the database, we can use nicknames as alternative designations. And we see it here that the, the, the capture that took place on, in 752 is the work of Yashun Balam's Lancet. It's a, it, it's a famous expression in here. We're still having a lot of discussions about this Yehete expression, which could be something, uh, if we describe it, it is the Lancet work. It is the work with the Lancet of Yashun Balam, a three cartoon king, meaning that he is between 40 and 60 years old when this text was created. He is the one who took 20 captives. He is the godly divine king of Pacham Yashilan. You see here, there's a direct connection between the text and the image. The image shows the capture of, 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 of this um, Yash something talk. And one of the th things when you, um, when you work with this inscription is we, we, you will soon notice that this caption here, the third text field, has a larger font than the smaller, than this one and this one here. Why is that? That's something that I presented in Cambridge um, in 2019 at a conference with Pete Pastille, he, with, a, with a great um, um, project there. And it's the size, the size matters because this, is the, this text field contains the name of the king of the, of the ca capturing this guy. And the guy being captured has a small, very tiny um, hieroglyph. So si sizes in hierarchy, or the si sizes of hieroglyphs do reflect um, um, hierarchies. And this is something important. We, we want to, um, uh, uh, want to um, compile in our, in, our, in our text database. And, for, and that's the reason why we, we are using XML TI, because in XML TI, you can describe what you see. For example, saying that this text field is larger in comparison to this text field or this text field. And of course, um, hieroglyphic texts on, and monuments do not simply contain a title and visual or textual information. There's much more. For example, this is next. What, what do we, what can you, what can you um, grab? What information do we have uh, in related to a simple monument? It's about, you have um, information about the properties, materials, shape, techniques, the condition state is being can be um, documented. Dimensions of the of the whole monument, of the glyph blocks, of the people, the location and context of the of the monument. It was found some when, somewhere, some somehow. This is something that you document, and of course you document documentation of this um, of this monument, which was this one was found in 1882. It was brought to the British Museum. Yeah, it was one. It was. It, it is one of. Uh, one of the lintels that was brought from Yashilan to the British Museum, where you still can see it. So you also can document the holder or the collection in which this original is. The function, of course, we, you document the function of this piece. It's, it was originally a lintel. You see it is here. Um, this is another lintel from Yashilan, a, a replica. And of course, you can add the information about archives. For example, do we have any archival materials about this 
this monument photographs and so on. Here we document the representation of, of, of this lintel. So we have drawings, we have images, we have 3D things. So you see here, there's a, 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 whole, a whole world of information about one monument. It's not simply this, a monument is not text and image, it's, it's context. The meaning of a monument is its context. And we document it by using I, I'll give you a simple um, example. How does it work? We know that this lintel 16 is, was, is, was located or is located in structure 21 here. And structure 21 is part of Yashilan. I'll give you here the, 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 the graphs. And Yashilan is part of Chiapas. Chiapas is part of Mexico. So following the graph means that Yashilan lintel 16 comes from Mexico, or structure 21 is in Chiapas. So you, it's, 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 it's a very um, nice way to combine image, inform, to combine in information. This is the advantage of graph databases with, with relational databases. It will be quite difficult to, to construct this information. And now, we know from archaeological data and from, uh, from the literature that in the same structure we have lintel um, 15, 16, and 17, and the stela that are sound a bit later. You can describe in a database, you described it, it is located in. Next thing is also located in. And of course, you can now describe the discovery event, saying that this is an image of A.P. Maudsley, Alfred Percival Maudsley, who discovered this structure when um, in 1882. In the, in the technology science, you say, you, you def define this, that Maudsley discovered structure 21, and this discovery event has a date. So, and all the other monuments have dates. You can, in, 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 a, in this database, we have this, we have this, we, we, we give this information as, kind, uh, as, uh, as graphs. So, if you are, if you have this whole network of information, um, then you can do reasoning in this network of graphs. AP Mosley visited Mexico, Mexico, oh sorry, Mexico is of course the journal that I'm working for, Mexico in 1882, and structure 21 is dedicated in or after 752. In, the date, in, the, in, in, in our database, we don't have the information, this direct information that Mosley visited Mexico in 1882. You follow the graph here, here, or you follow the graph, you follow here the structure, you go here and you go there, and you say here that there's a direct connection between this, this discovery event and Mexico. So that's the advantage of reasoning in, in a network of graphs. Let's go back to, this, to the hieroglyphic texts. Um, in order to work with hieroglyphic texts, we had to give names to the things. We had to create a a, a um, controlled vocabulary of everything. That, and let's start here with, 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 the, with the, the carved surface. Um, the surface that contains carving is the carved surface. Then there's graphics. And for those of you familiar with XML TI, we soon notice that there's a correspondence between surface graphics. There is a text body. This is the designation for all the texts that is, that is in, a, in a document. There's a text field and there are glyph blocks. And glyph blocks often can be, have, can be segmented in, 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 in smaller segments of blocks. And of course, there is the sign or the, there are the signs. In this case, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm used my, I used the new drawings that I did for the, for the project. Here, two signs. This glyph block here, or this segment here, contains of these two signs. So these are the basic units that we that we designate like this. And now, for those of you who, are, who aren't familiar with my hieroglyphic writing, um, I give you some of the reading sequences that are normal, or that are, are standard. It's usually it's from left to right and top to bottom. I give here some arrows here, so you from top to bottom up so the idea left to right and in a text field is often is, is usually 
um, read in, in a double column here, also from left to right. Then you go to the next line, to the next um, block, and the next block. So it's double column, left to right, top to bottom. And within the block, the reading order is also left to right. And if you segment it, it's from top to bottom. So this is, the, and um, this is something we can mark in an XML TI file. That's important because some of the hieroglyphic texts have a, a reading order from right to left. And now some, um, some, um, how the, uh, some information about the, in, um, the, how the Maya writing system works. Yeah, here I'm introducing some designations which are not very often used in our field. Um, phonogram for syllables or uh, syllabic signs, morphograms for um, logograms. There's a whole bunch of, um, of, of, of designations for the same thing. I used here this phonogram based on Gordon Whittaker's quite recent work on Aztec writing. And here you can see you can spell hieroglyphic words just using syllables. It's, the, it's this word at the beginning of the inscription, chuka for uh, representing the root chuk to cease. And on the other side, you have um, word signs, morphographs, the morphograms. In this case, it, it consists of the word sign for yash, for green, then a, a question mark, which we can, a glyph that shows, shows an inverted ways with uh, some kind of curl. We can't read it at the moment. And I just, I'm not sure about the sec last um, um, thing. It could be also the sign for talk. I was, not, I was not sure. So it's at least this, this name of this person consists of three um, um, logographs. And of course, the Maya script could combine both ways of spelling words, like saying combining phono, um, syllabic, morphographic um, spellings, like we have it here for the name of the king of Yashilan, Yashun Balam. And this is one way of spelling his name. You see it, it's, it's in here. It's this, I, I redrew it by using our fonts. It's Ya, the, 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 the word sign for Yashun, the Kodinga bird, Balam for Jaguar. And this Ma here is used as a phonetic indicator that the logograph here is ending in M, Ma. So it's, it's repeating the Ma, the M sound. Um, one of the difficulties in the Maya, uh, one of the difficulties in Maya writing is, um, is that of course Maya scrap could spell the um, the words in, in different ways. The Maya scrap, for example, could spell the word Balam just with a word sign or, or with a phonetic indicator, or phonetically here Balama. This is an example from Nachtunich. Um, if you you very often see this in publications. Um, if you see it as it's, it's just using transliteration or transcriptions of hieroglyphic blocks. If you have this information, it doesn't give you any idea how the original block or the original spelling is looking like, like this. So one of the, of the must of this database project is to combine images with, this, um, with these spellings because it looks like this. Um, the word Yashun Balam, there are four, there are, this is a, an example of just four examples of different spellings for the, for the same name of king. It's Yashun Balam. But you see, the, the Ya sign is over there. This is the Kodinga. It's squeezed on the top. Now the Ya is larger. The, it's, the Kodinga is on the top. And sometimes they even can change the position and put it in front of it or use another Ma syllable to indicate um, here the, that the name is Ma. And one interesting thing is, I'm going back here a bit, is why is he using this phonetic element Ma here? That's the reason why it, 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 it's, it's, it's space. The space determines that he wanted to use the Ma sign because he started quite with a large Ya sign, with a larger thing sign. And when he, when he was to fill this um, this gap here, then he decided I'm, do, I'm doing a smaller um, quadratic sign and adding this, the ma. So using phonetic complementation is not, is something that also relies on the space that is available for, for the texts. That we have, to, we have to consider this. And 
the, one of the hardest things that was difficult in the Maya studies is the graphic, I call, we, I call it allomorphism, graphic allomorphism. This is something that some of you know from other, my other presentations, and this is the very same, the spelling of the name of the king Yashumbalam in standard way and in, in the so-called full figure hieroglyphs. You can see it here. The, all, this is the head of the jaguar, and this is the full, the full body uh, jaguar. You see here the, the head here with his paws. And the interesting thing is now there seems also some kind of um, full concept hieroglyphs because together with the, with the jaguar, the, very often is the so-called jaguar god of the underworld. He's depicted here. And there is not, there is not only a so-called full body hieroglyph, so, but also some kind of full concept hieroglyph. We have other um, hieroglyphs where, for example, other concepts are squeezed together. And of course, the Kodinga is here, and the Ya syllable is here. This is the mosquito here. It's left it's white here, and it's the, it's a, a, this, one is an, this one here on the left side is an abbreviated form for this uh, mosquito sign here. And it took, it took, it took re research quite long to, to find that this is the very same bird. And now uh, with regard to the cataloging work or the, the catalog, catalog of Maya hieroglyphs, I can give you some in, in, uh, in, in excerpts from different catalogs that have been published so far. Um, in, in, usually my catalogs of science Let's be it the gardener catalog, be it um, the Borg catalog for cuneiform signs. The author always have to make a decision which sign is going to represent a, a full range of which um, is being is, um, is being going to be represent the sign. For example, Alexander Tokivinine in a, in his latest um, catalog of Maya glyphs has chosen to draw a, this head for the for the jaguar in the thompson catalog thompson has chosen these two examples nikola gruber has chosen this one here in his catalog knorosov um, took this one here and so on and so on the macri project has given a few examples from the codices and from um, other sources here this is this is um, from yashilan this is from Yash this is also from the kopan and yashilan and you see here this is just the original drawing and so on. Now, let's have a look at the reality. This is the reality of my research. Which one is the best example to represent Balam? It's, it's something very difficult. You even say, um, this is my, the, the new drawing of this full figure hieroglyph for Balam. And there is another full figure hieroglyph representing Balam. It's in here. It's in the name of a Naranjo queen. And you see it's a completely different. The only um, thing is that, 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 that can be combined is it's the full body is depicted. The same is with the, with, the, with the head of a jaguar. If you are not familiar with my hieroglyphic writing, it would be difficult to recognize that this one here is the same sign as this one here or this one here. Um, one of the things that we're going to test in the near future is with a colleague from Mainz. We're going to test artificial um, intelligence, whether there can be some kind of morphism to say, to, to, to use all the available drawings or um, 3D scan of a monument and to combine it into one sign, which is being some kind of the average. What is the, what is the average of all these signs here? This is a project we are currently planning. And of course, um, the thing with the, um, um, one of the epigraphic practices that we encounter is cataloging allographs. Um, in the first line, you see different um, allographs for the, sign, for the syllable pa. Um, they are really the same, very same signs. We know it from the context. And you see it here in, in the, Thompson, has attributed, had thought in 1962 that this is a different sign like this one, this one. So he, he made, he, he gave them different sign numbers here. And NN means he did include this one here. And XT1, XT1 is the designation from the Martha Macri project. They 
simply don't care about signal variation. They simply gave all, um, they simply gave one code for all the other graphs, which is not good if you want to do paleographic studies. The same with the syllable ha on, on the bottom. Let's go to the next thing. And when we were, when we were discussing, um, uh, for example, here, I just have to go back here. You see here, this is a full variant of the half syllable. It can be split in half and it can sometimes, it can, the, 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 the row of dots can be like this or that way. So, and there is even a, a head variant showing the moon god. Moon god is representing the syllable half. When we were discussing our concept for a new sign catalog in 2016, we noticed there's something going on with the signs. Let's have a look at the syllable no. These are examples from um, Copan, where you have the full, this is the so-called full version or standard version. And this is used in this way. This is, and sometimes the brackets here can be there, and sometimes that can be, need not be there. Or they just simply use the brackets here, or they uh, use some kind of these, these curves. This is a kind of bracket here. Um, the thing is now, if you have a close look at what's going on here, they cut and they cut the glyphs. They cut it. They cut them horizontally or vertically. So, for sometimes they simply used um, um, they simply used, for example, the left of the full part, and this one here with the bracket with, with this curse here with the main element is this part here or just this part. And this is something that works well with other known hieroglyphs. So we noticed that there is a um, segmentation principle going on here. For example, this is the full variant of the syllable ma. It consists of the upper element, it consists of a lower element and a element which does never represent ma. So sometimes a scribe just used this upper element or simply used this one. The same with the syllable t, they cut it in half they just used the upper element or just used the lower element. So there are, um, there are some symmetrical um, segmentation principle that can be applied to designate the type of variation in Maya writing system. You see it here. This is the full thing here. Um, some of the signs cannot be split, but many of them can be cut in vertical or horizontally as you see it here. So, um, okay, this is part of a, this is, we, we published this, um, this, um, this result in a German paper. We are presently go, um, going to publish a, a, a English version for that. This is, for example, um, um, an overview, a systematic overview of all these um, segment, segmentation principles that we find in, in Maya writing. It's, there are more. There are some signs that cannot be um, segmented. They are, they are, we call them ST, standard. And for example, if there's a sign that can be is bipartite, it can be split in vertical and horizontal, tripartite, ver, um, vertical or horizontal. And then the scribe could choose, um, for, I mean, not only, I'm just using the top part or the bottom part, top bottom, so bipartite top, bipartite bottom. And this, um, we, this is quite a um, nice um, way to, to, dis to designate the graphic variation of the allographs in my hieroglyphic writing. And what does it mean? What's going, what, how, what is the result of this? So um, alphabetic suffixes refer to the intragraphemic segmentation principles and uh, are an aid to systematize the sign variability. Um, so it means if you find a, in a catalog the sign 181BH, it means it's bipartite horizontally um, split, and then you can the left part is bipartite left, the right part is bipartite right, the same. And BL always means left, BL always means left. So if you want to see which sign can be split in BL, you can easily find all these graph variants. So if we apply this system to, our, to, the, to the foreseen um, uh, thing here, you see here, um, we, we, we make the difference between a sign and a graph. 
a sign is always related to the linguistic information and there are um, graphic or there are graphic representations of the sign so a sign has a number and now it can have of course the standard version standard 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 head human head creature full figure creature and the same with bipartite horizontal bipartite left and ha harmonic head human so this allows us to to at least to 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 designate the allographs in my hieroglyphic writing, what we are not doing. You see here, there, is, there are some, um, there is a difference between this representation and this representation. We, we are not introducing now a, a third system, which gives, for example, here that this um, net, net thing is lower or higher than this one. We don't do this. This is too, um, this would be stupid. And one of the things that we are, what we are doing with the, in the design catalog is to, um, to, to, to give a concordance to the former catalogs. If we, if you see here, for example, the left part is our catalog. On the right side, we see here the original depictions from the previous catalogs from Nikolai Grube, Martha Macri. And here is on, on this column, you have their, um, their designation or their, numer numer their, their um, systemacy. This is one. This is an important element for for our work. And here, another example. You see here that um, the sign 181 BL is in the Ringer Star catalog. If we can find it under this designation, or the Knorosov catalog has it as under number 34. So we're still um, preparing this one. It's it's a lot of work. It's 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 attributing thousands of small images to our to the to the new drawings that we did. And in order to, 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 to save data, uh, to save this information about the, um, the, the, the science we, we are using again, the text grid um, virtual environment. It, here you see here the, the sign and graph element here, and it looks like this. And I, I, in, in the next level, I can attribute a sign number, and then I can choose has the sign in the local graphic reading has to assign a logographic meaning, a syllabic reading, a diacritic function, and so on and so on. And we can, of course, um, add sources here. And what's, what's the, the sense and function of this entry mask? The entry mask is automatic, automatically transforming this information here into a XML file, an RDF XML file. So it's a helper that supports the research of us um, non-IT people in order to create this, um, this XML file. So this, is, this has been part of our, uh, the work of our project partner in Göttingen. They did an amazing job. So you have this information up the bottom here. I just invented something here. Then the thing is that in our, in our system, we have created some kind of, com uh, of, of confidence, uh, attributing confidence level for the reading. Because in the hieroglyphic research, it is the fact that some glyph readings are, uh, plausible, are very plausible or are fixed, and that they are, they, are, um, they, um, they are controlled. And many of the hieroglyphic signs that, that are under discussions are, aren't still completely deciphered. And what we did in the preparation of our catalog is that we, we went into the literature and checked when do our colleagues, for example, um, give, um, um, uh, when is a reading accepted or not, was our thing. So we, we, we checked all the hundreds of articles in the literature and noticed, for example, when a reading is somewhere attested in a colonial source like in Diego de Landa, it's, it's accepted. When there's a complete phonetic substitution, it's accepted. Is there a partial phonetic, partial phonetic substitution? Is there a homophonic substitution and so on? This system has been first um, developed by um, David Kelly in 1976. Stephen Houston has written up something similar a, a few decades later. Um, with a book with with, um, with 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 David and 
Yeah, I, I can't remember the moment. I should have written it down. So the thing is that um, the, the assessment of reading goes like this. This has been, um, it, it was our work. It's uh, many of the catalog entries, many of the many parts of the catalog work has been done with Sven Gronemeyer. Then we had a lot of discussions with Elie Wagner, Nikolai, and, and here is uh, one of the results. For example, um, when, is a read, when, is a, when is a reading accepted or fully, uh, when is there the best, the best um, score for a reading? When, it, for example, if you have a look at it, it has D, which is over there a colonial source, or H, a homophonic substitution, or it has complete phonetic substitution, and P, it's, it's part, it's, it's, it fulfills the expected part of speech. And if you're applying this, um, this system to this, you, cr you make hatchings here, crossings here, it gets an automatic value. So this is some kind of, um, of, of a helper which shows that, for example, a reading has the best score or a reading has the worst score, which is eight. And let's have a, clue, a look at the sign for uh, the coup here. It has the sign number 528. This, is a, this has been, this graphics comes from my colleague, former colleague, Francisca Thier. And she showed, for example, that the sign has a logographic reading. And what is the confidence level of logographic reading? Because it, it, the sign has a complete phonetic substitution. It's postponed, it's postponed, and so on. All these, um, parameters here are fulfilled, so it gets automatic the one. And there's also um, the idea that this sign also represents the logograph Chahook. So we checked, we checked all the data, and does it fulfill the expected part of speech? Yeah, it's uh, tested in language, in the, in the greater Lowland languages, but it, there are no phonetic substitutions for this. And that's the reason why the, the score is that bad. And the same, of course, with, with the coup. The ku sign and the tun sign. For the tun sign, we have phonetic sub full phonetic substitution to nu, for example, or to ni in Chichen Itza. And ku is attested in Landa's manuscript. So we are, we are testing now all the readings that are available and we can score them. And of course, literature is part of the documentation of science. You find it here. This is, for example, uh, this is part of the Soterotic uh, um, database. And now the thing, part of the dictionary work was to, was to create new drawings. Um, we decided that I'm going to draw all the signs because if someone else would, would, we would be drawing other signs, it would be, at, uh, you could easily see that there's another artist at work. So this part of the work is my, my, my lone, lone work, but this has a practical reason because it will change the, the font. It looks some kind of Unicode. It's, um, this is something that might be the basis for Unicoding hieroglyphs. Can, for someone who is um, interested in using these signs as a, as, as a future Unicode can use it. But at the moment we are, uh, we are using them, we are only using numerical, value, numerical values in the TI document. And, and part of the dictionary word looks like this. So you can, uh, the sign number 707 has these graphic variations here, or the sign number 716 has, the, has a full, full body or the full, uh, this um, head, um, uh, the head, 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 this head variant here, full creature, head creature, and so on. So you see here, is this is odd, this is, um, done quite fast in a, in, a, in, a, in a request of the database, which is actually not available for the public at the moment. And some of the things that I already showed you is here that we um, have a concordance of all the um, drawings of that specific science from other catalogs. So at least we see here 14 different catalogs that have been published so far. We, we create a concordance and they can easily work with the original here or work with this one. We are, of course, are going to work with our new designation of science. In order to make things machine readable in my hieroglyphic inscription, um, this is a, a, a copy paste from the Corpus of My Hieroglyphic Inscriptions website. And if you have a look at it, 
you see here some red things. It's, it's a reading that is questionable. This is questionable. There is something unreadable with the ya. Yeah. And you soon will see um, a pure transliteration, or transla transliteration transcription is not enough to represent the original spelling of my hieroglyphic writing. So this is our, um, this is something that we compiled in the past. A transliteration, transli transcription, and translation or, um, cannot fully represent the or original rendering spellings and formalities, the blocks of the size of the blocks, the choice of signs and graph variants, and so on. The original text arrangement is not vis visible, is, cannot be made visible. And the thing is that if when you're using, you know, when you're working like this, with a question mark, this is for a database unusable. It's unusable. So 30% of all known signs are still undeciphered, and you cannot work with question marks. So, and the thing, the main thing that we have to consider is that the visual and the spoken word in the classic Maya text differ. So you see it here that uh, the reading order of this in the block can change. So, and if you change it here, you don't see the, the, the reading order, the original reading order. So preliminary is to consider before TI encoding. And TI is a, is a standard that is used in the, in the text, in the, in, the, in the digital humanities in order to encode, to describe, formally describe and analyze text semantically. And this is something that this is for now from another um, um, PowerPoint that I compiled, as you see in last niche little two, we have a lot of metadata that we compiled from our, in our database, which is not important for this thing. But if you have a look at the, of the text, you see here that you get here text field that uh, have, a, have a little angle, they are smaller text field, larger text field, a huge text field um, underneath the king. Why is the text, why is this the largest text field? He's sitting on his name glyph. Again, the same pattern as we have it in Yashilan and elsewhere. It's, it's a pattern that I described in a, in a publication which will come soon. And so you have here different text fields with different sizes and different numbers of things. And this one is read in from left to right, uh, top to bottom. And for example, this is one of the few examples where text is read from right to left, from top to bottom and so on. And this is something that you cannot describe simply uh, using this um, transliteration system. So in order to work with hieroglyphic inscriptions, we decided that our, our, that as a basis of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the text annotation, we use numbers found here. In, in usually in the literature, you use to Zaha, but this expression here, meaning it, has, it got finished, uh, it can be expressed also in the sign numbers with the, with the abbreviation or for the sign uh, for the sign variation head creature because this two sign can also be spelled differently so meaning that with the bracket the bracket here um, explains that the zaha here form is 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 a, a segment within the hieroglyphic block and in the hieroglyphic block you say and now this is taken from Zimmerman and Thompson something glyph 699 is above 188, and this segment stands left or stands right to 370. We have to use these brackets in order to, um, to, to, to represent the original spelling. Why is this necessary? This is an example that I used uh, several times. You see here, this is the very, this is uh, the variant. This is always the same expression, UTR, it happened. And you see it, it can be expressed with different sign. The, 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 the sign the, can be UTR is correctly here, but here we have Uyati, Uhyati, and Uhyati. So the scribe just changed the reading order, the, 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 not the reading order, but the, the spelling order. So spelling and reading is different in my hieroglyphic writing, and of course with different sign numbers. So if you just got this one, you don't have any idea about the original spelling. Let's now dive into the Maya epigraphy, and these are uh, as a bunch of, of, of signs that, of, of, of blocks or of glyphs that represent the very same expression, EUT. It comes from a public publication by David Stewart on in, from 1990 and serves here quite well to show 
the high vari variability of signs and graphs in the hieroglyphic writing. And it took research uh, decades to, to, to find out that this is the very same hieroglyph. And David Stewart has deciphered this um, hieroglyph in 30 years ago. And let's, so for us for the, uh, this is a good example that Maya scribe invented a lot of different signs for the, for the, for the syllable U. It's one of the most co um, uh, no, well known, or the most um, not common, uh, the most uh, uh, frequent signs here, as it is a pronoun. You see it here on the left side, we see here this U variant here. And on the bottom here, this is the full variant of the U. And there's on, on the part, here's the bipartite element here. This is an inverted vessel. This is a, a fish, a, a, a shark, present map, there's something like that. A monkey head, this is a human head with blood, it's a, and, and so on here. This is just a, a small selection of signs that are, that are used for U. And now I'm, I'm, I'm citing a, a, a PowerPoint by, by Francisca Thier, who presented this one. So encoding Maya text means that you have to create a TI schema. For those who are familiar with XML TI, you, you know this, this, this works here. And we use a standoff markup in order to refer to the sign catalog that we saw. We combine the information from the sign catalog with the TI document. And uh, the encoding um, of the hieroglyphic inscription is done by a parcel that I'm going to present quite soon. So textual elements will be defined like this. And that's the reason why as at the beginning, I gave you an introduction to the terminology. Text field, this is text field. Or the, the, the text division here, we use the, the TI document um, uh, element diff for text division. AB is, is used for anonymous block, and the type is glyph block, we, um, and the G is for the single glyphs here. And the reference here is here, this one here, text grid, this URI here is referring to its um, entry in the sign catalog. So under the URI text grid 84 and so on, you find this specific graph variant in our text catalog. So we use, of course, this is the, 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 the numeric uh, uh, classification here, or, and you see it here. And in order to uh, work with hieroglyphic inscriptions, and now some of you will see, uh, some, many of you working with hieroglyphic inscriptions will see that there's a difference between the, the way we did it before and do it now. So we have to describe the text. We have to describe what hieroglyph is in there. We, at the moment, we are not really reading it. We have to identify the single signs. And I say, and, and you say here, we use here the diff. This is the, the blue thing is here, the diff, the text division. Then the yellow thing is the anonymous block, A1, D1. And in here, if you go here, it's the yellow one. The green one is the, are the single glyphs. And the red one here is the, is the segment. And in, in order to describe um, the hieroglyphs by using TI, we, we describe there's a, there's a text, there's a block. The block consists of signs. And this sign, um, there's a, there's a, there are the glyph groups. And this is in order to describe the text. But in order to describe the signs, the position of the signs, we introduced something new, which might be helpful for other um, epigraphic projects in here. Uh, uh, have a look at it. Um, for the anonymous block D1, this is D1 here, we say there is um, D1, G1. Uh, this is the um, uh, G cliff one is left beside segment one. Segment one is right beside G1. And then we go to the sec into the segment. D1, G1 is above D1, G3. And D1, G3 is beneath this one. And this enables us to describe the original position of the sign in the hieroglyphic block. And we have uh, invented a, a, a few other um, uh, 
this describe us like for example when um, when uh, when 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 glyphs are in fixed or enclosed or oh, sorry conflated attached at the top left so we introduced this this system here where we describe that the glyph is above beneath in fixed in is enclosed conflated conflate attached at or is joined at the top left this enables us to represent the the original spelling of the hieroglyphic block and it, it works quite, it works good. This is a very famous example from Bonham Park, and this is where um, the scribe artfully squeezed two words in one single sign. If you read it from left to right, you see here, you would read it cha a na hobi ma, like I have it here. But of course, the reading is different because the, 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 the scribe used it here cha. Cha ho ma. Here there is the part of the R syllable A na B. So they squeezed what two words in one single block, and you can easily describe this using our system here. You can at the moment you cannot describe this by using, for example, Unicode. So that's the reason, one of the reasons why we still but we are, but we, but we will be using TI instead of Unicode. And supporting our workshop, our workflow is a parcel because you can imagine it takes you, it would take you days in order to create something like this uh, if you do it manually. At the moment we work like this. Um, we just um, enter the, the numeric transcription and the parcel then transforms numeric transliterations into a TI encoding. It enables to structure the text according to the schema. It automatically assigns values for the XML ID, the N and the ref, and so on. So we, we researchers, we, we just work with this numerical transcription and the parser is uh, transforming this into a TI. This looks like this. This is the, the TI document we are working with, or the, the XML document. We, 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 feed, we feed the parser with the element we give um, we give the information what monument is it, and then it automatic automatically creates the XML document here, and we also have the uh, possibility to represent the signs in uh, using our new glyph fonts. So you can easily check is my transliteration uh, numeric transliteration correct. So um, this is at the moment only available for the researchers here in Bonn. But it, it helps, really it helps fasten our, 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 our work. So we can, uh, we can describe the reading direction with the text field and we use CSS style, as you can see it here. Um, it's the reading direction from um, left to right, right to left, top to bottom. We can, of course, describe the text arrangement. Also see here the green thing saying that the text field, the green text field is, rota is rotated 45 degrees. And so on. It's and the reading order is text to, um, top to bottom. We we link our textual information with the original drawing here, on in the Schiele. So we can easily um, give you all always the, the original context of this um, of the of the of the script of the thing. And now going back, what's happening now? We were as I told you, we're working just at the moment with numerical transcriptions, but our TI document is connected with the sign catalog and the sign catalog has all the readings. So, it, and that's the reason why we, we, we are using these URIs here, um, leading back to the, to the graph, in, uh, to the graph. And from the graph, you go to the sign. So you see the graph is graph of sign and with the information, the sign has all the readings. So, then a tool which we are currently programming and which we, we should be ready by the end of the year is now um, is, is creating is creating automat semi automatically these readings out from the from the numerical transcription here and up to the semi automatic um, translate translate transliteration of the text and then we can change the then we can add here more information about the text structure. The linguistic analysis. So we have, I think I soon come to the end. 
The ontological corpus looks like this. There's a bibliography. It's connected with the artifact ontology. The artifact, the artifact is connected with the vocabularies that I show you. The linguistic annotations with the, our, our annotator, which is being the, currently being programmed, is connected with this. The TI document is connected with this. And the archival materials, the, 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 the website, the, the, the image database that, it, that we have, is connected with the TI document. So at, at the end, you have an ontology of Maya inscriptions consisting of um, numeric translate, transliterations, linguistic translations of hieroglyphs. So this is where we are at the moment. We have started to to work now with the inscriptions from Ushul, Chaktun, and um, Oshpemul. Work continues, and soon we're going to publish these materials that I showed you very soon. The portal the, the will be published within the next six months. So many things that, uh, that you can see at the moment will be visible soon. And now I am ready. I am I'm stopping now. Uh, how much? Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Wow. <laughs> what a titanic project and what a joint multi-layered effort putting all this knowledge together to, piece, to put together the pieces of such an incredible puzzle because we know that the Maya script is one of the most complex in terms of what you call the graphic allomorphism and um, yeah, yeah configurations of all the signs. I believe we don't have much time for discussion, so I'm gonna just fire away with one tiny question. You yeah. mentioned, and then leave the audience for their own questions. I don't want to keep uh, too much space for my very many questions, actually. Uh, you mentioned 133 undecided signs, right? with a certain degree of plausibility in yeah. reading them for 74% of them, which yeah. really leads to quite a, a, a sort of a, an exhaustive and systematic reading of the whole, uh, the whole script, which I didn't know about. It seems like um, new news, as it were. And my question has to do with the problems that comes with having to tackle those 133 signs that we can't really read with 100% certainty. Is the allomorphism, are the configurations of signs the real obstacle or the rarity of certain signs and the oddities of several configurations within um, the text that lead to that assumption? Or is it, because the readings are uncertain, out of damaged and poor preservations of the finds? Or is, is it because there's a bias in the way that the sign repertoire has been interpreted from Thompson onwards and you're trying to correct the mistakes that are still outstanding? What, what are the critical factors that make the, the reading of these 133 signs so difficult? So the, oh, thank you very much for this um, question. The 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 the, 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 the one of the main problems of many many signs is that they are sometimes quite unique. And unique signs mean that you have no control of the of the of the of the context. And usually, um, a, a, a hieroglyphic sign is then deciphered, for example, a logograph when you have an absolute control of its context and you know that there are phonetic, a full phonetic substitution of, 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 of the sign, which is then in, um, we have, as I, as I told, I gave you, the, as I told you before, 51% of the sign ha have the highest quality. So if you just um, argue with the, with the, the with this that they have to have the 50 well that they have the highest quality we we can say at the moment 51 percent of the script is deciphered to be uh -huh. very critical with the material because um for, for many readings are uh, are published um we have um, uh, my hieroglyphic decipherment is still it's it, it, it's it's a kind of workshop we are testing glyphs we are testing them with new materials we hope that we find new materials and Many, many signs that are deciphered um, um, 
or our, uh, let's say the, we only have um, phonetic complementation at the end of a sign. Mm -hmm. We know from the we know we have a semantic control. We know that it has it has it matches in some context. But if you just have a phonetic complementation at the end of the sign, you don't there you can you can create about five to ten different reading that may may match which is the case for example with the so-called star war hieroglyph the a war hieroglyph that has now about ten different readings and if you if you apply all these um parameters that we defined in order to to um, to uh to to plausible to plausible these uh, signs um then you have a lot of uh, readings that are around that are insecure mm -hmm. um, for example um there are some uh, uh we, we 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 but we're still publishing on i mean uh, our colleagues from from the project other colleagues from other universities are publishing this um hypothesis we need to publish this hypothesis we need to test them so um there are many readings around and one of the main, main problems is really that the context is not doesn't give too much um, explicit information so we we have for example readings uh, well established readings the uh, n for cave which for which we don't have any phonetic substitution so but the context matches perfectly mm -hmm. and so but it cannot have a, a full plausible reading so it never get it has not the, the reading um, um, possibility one because it's it's we're missing a so you go by context and analogy but you can't really seal the deal and say this is confirmation validation from external sources okay from independent argumentation and that's an important thing to to give uh, pl um, uh, plausibility to the sign readings because we at the end we don't want to create a Maya dictionary just with readings which are uncertain of course so it means that we have to make a different we have to differentiate between reading one and the rest so since it's it's a digital dictionary it doesn't matter if the reading does change we we can automatically change all the readings in the in the textual document so but at the uh, we at the beginning uh, we have to work with, with secured readings because um it's it's it would not be good to 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 work with a with a, a, a lexicon with a reading which is not well established yes so that so uh, we can filter we use the we, we use these um these um these um numbers that we attribute to the reading certainty as filter mm -hmm. great fantastic i can't wait to to see the end of the project and the results more questions from our audience can i can I ask a little question? Yeah. Can you hear me? So, good evening. First of all, thank you very much for your very interesting account of your project. So, uh, since you mentioned the semantic analysis of your of the lexemes of Mayan uh, under the Mayan writing, uh, I will uh, I would like to to ask if uh, your uh, database and how your database can be used for some for investigating some specific issues and features uh, semantic features uh, for example trivially the verb valency or the aspectual and uh, actional properties of uh, one uh, single lexical entries which of course generally require a more extensive a more extensive study but with a, a computerized a digitalized database can be much more easy and automatic thank you very much for this um, important question it's it's it will be part of a second uh, talk about uh, to talk about because i haven't included the, the the discussion, the analysis of the the, the the linguistic analysis, how we 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 manage it, it's 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 based. We do it on twelve levels, starting from the numerical values, with um, and going over to uh, to the to the morpho morpho glossing and so on. So this is all included. It will be included as you as as you asking it, but um, you can request you can uh, request uh, anything. 
I mean, really, if you want to work with a spe specific suffix in my hieroglyphic writing, you can search for it. You can search for semantics. Semantics, semantic fields are indicated. So, um, um, but this is um, this is part of a of a computer tool, which is being um, developed now at the moment. And as I am not a linguist, I must say I'm a, I'm a hardcore epigrapher, and this is something which would be very good to uh, to 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 work with a linguist in this moment here, um, to um, to refine our ideas and to 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 um, the th yeah the thing is really. Um, at the moment, we cannot think about the, 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 the product of the project, the dictionary, because we don't have, we just have started to analyze the texts. But we still have, uh, now it's 2020, nine years. But for at the beginning of next year, this will be a very important issue, as you say. So linguistics comes, but uh, needs more needs more uh, detailed work but it's we we thought about it thank you yeah. i love it that you had to apologize for not being a hardcore linguist <laughs> when no, no. presentation you could easily be one with the expertise that you showed is there a, oh there's a chat question uh asking about the unicode how will it work or how should it work Christian, it's a big question. Um, the thing is, um, I got a very, uh, this is something that is always being discussed about unicoding Maya hieroglyph, which is, there, is some, there are some efforts in that, but not from our part. The thing is that um, I got the impression that Unicode very often um, destroys, let's say that way, uh, the, um, um, Paleographic studies. If you if you don't uh, um, if you do, if you doing if you doing uh, if you apply if you're using um, fonts like I uh, using in here, you you will never, for example, get an idea how is the original spelling of the of the text. So it's 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 something that um, I can I can give you I, I can tell you a, sm a small story about this one. I, I took uh, two years ago I took a class in Egyptian hieroglyphs. And we only learned hieroglyphs from the from the fonts, and then uh, after several weeks, we we were uh, we they gave us original hieroglyphic inscriptions on monuments, not not the nice ones, but this this the, or the, the the hieratic things and so on. You will never you will uh, if you learn hieroglyphs just with with nice forms and so on, you will never you will never can read um, original inscriptions. So the thing is that my impression is that the encoding of for encoding for um, Unicode should be should wait a bit. We 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 we, we, we will come. We will share our materials in the next years. So I would welcome a, a project that would cooperate with us um, to work to work out a Unicode characters, but not at the moment. Um, it's something that that needs to be done in the background and. As I told you, I calculated if you would if you would represent all the sign variation in my graphic writing using Unicode, you would have to create about six to seven thousand Unicode signs. Of course, sometimes the, this this circle is missing, this is missing. The variation is too big to create a normative character. You can, of course, you can create everything in in in, in, in Unicode. But then you have uh, a character set about twenty to thirty thousand different characters, which is not quite comfortable to use. So what we we may, what we decided is that we just create some kind of best example for a hieroglyph, the, the thing that we think it's a best example. But we are, uh, for that we are not better than Thompson other and other other catalog projects because we have to make the decision. Which one does represent is the, the, the Balam, for example, best? This is my impression, and another colleague in, 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 in the States, in Russia, and so on, has other ideas. So the thing, the, one of the advantages, advantages working with TechSprit uh, laboratory and TechSprit um, 
text image link editor that you can easily create um, a paleographic sign list in, in, by combining, for example, I want to see all the hieroglyphic blocks that have this and this sign in there. Then you cut out, cut out it from the orig original inscription, and then you have a, you can line them up here. All the texts, all the text, all the blocks that contain have this sign, and then you can create something um, that could be a best example. And this would be a good some. This would be a, a cool or is a pr cool project for artificial intelligence to create a, a sign, a morph, a morph system. Um, that where you can easily um, see which is the the average sign, which is the average of all the signs, known signs. I was going to say exactly that because at Inscribe we are working on this, on applying some sort of yes, automated, it's very interesting, yeah, yeah, it's automated system. But we we shouldn't be talking about that. But mm. yeah, we, we're at work on that end. But in, indeed, it's um, if 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 in the database you were to have a reference of automated find and search and find uh, for each glyph in its own configuration with its own idiosyncratic okay. diagnosticity, etc. That would be fantastic. Sorry, I had to show my enthusiasm. We have, uh, do we have any more questions? There is one, again, do you work with other Mesoamerican scripts? from Rohan Bontadurin, who asked about the Unicode previously. Have you worked with other Mesoamerican scripts? No, 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 They're just, we, um, I know that there are some, um, there's a project that tries to um, um, encode Aztec writing, but um, I don't know the, the progress of it. I haven't seen any examples. It's, it's, I think uh, Gordon Whittaker is working on that. Yeah. Uh, but was, um, I haven't seen, I, I just uh, I know the, the, the work by his presentations and so on. But um, I know that they are creating um, some standardized science, which is useful, but in order to, to, to do paleography, you have, of course, you have to combine these standardizations with, with the, all the known examples. And it's, Aztec writing is is is, is even uh, more difficult to um, to encode than Maya hieroglyphic writing because we 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 stay in the block and in in uh, Aztec writing you can add all the things on top on bottom on on the left side in between and so on. I'm sure you can you can create a TI um, TI um, schema that would work with that, but there are some scripts which need to, with which we need to work with the originals. So we'll need to ask Gordon when we see him yeah, next, we need to ask in January. Uh, there is a question from Jorge. Congratulations on the talk. How user friendly would you say the database is for non technically minded users? The multifunctionality does sound overwhelming for many of us. You don't need any. Um, I, as I told you, the, the work that I presented to you is not the technical things that I did not the technical things. All the, the programming and uh, the working out the metadata schema is not mine. And this was at the, at the beginning of 2014, we, uh, we were really lucky to work with specialists in the field. <clears throat> because sometimes many projects are working with with, 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 for example, I know that many projects are working with specialists in Maya writing who have uh, uh, some, some knowledge of computers thing. But the thing is, if you want to work out something that we created, you have to really have to work with specialists for information technology. And this is, we have to now come, we have grown together as a, as a very good team. But at the beginning, I can, I, I remember that we were talking two worlds. This is a very good experience that you have when you start working in a project where you have information techni technicians and um, <coughs> scientists uh, uh, <coughs> working with, 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 with the things like we, we do. And um, the, 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 the result then is, is user-friendly is, is user and user-friendly for non-IT people. This is something we will 
have a close look and there's always there's a, there's always something like a for for the people who are very who have already a very good knowledge about um, R, um <coughs> rdf or sparkle things there's always a an endpoint where you have can enter our database and grab the materials out so for example if you the, all the materials from the Coneda Core image database can be exported, can be all the metadata if you just have no, enough knowledge about um, Sparkle endpoints and so on. So it's, it's for, the, for the specialists and for the non-specialists and user-friendly. And something I haven't shown you is, for example, that some of the um, database of the, of the, the, um, the image database, but the, the, the artifact database is being exported to another um, database here at the University of Bonn. So this is the very user-friendly thing that shows just the image of the, of the, of the inscription with a, with a transliteration and, a, and, and, a, uh, and a translation in English and Spanish. So Technical but user friendly is your answer, I take it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we have more questions in the chat, but I would like, if at all possible, whoever wants to ask questions to unmute themselves and ask them directly to, to our Christian because it's much better for interaction to have direct questions. For instance, Daniel from Mexico. Mexico. My question is what is the teaching potential of this project? big one um for example the 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 drawings that we produced for all the for the science for the for the science and graphs they can easily be taken in order for example to use them in in in, in classes we um we will soon upload all the images they can be easily they can be used without uh, asking further permi uh, permission so if you, for example, want to, want to uh, create lists of sign or large sheets with the sign that represents, for example, a Jaguar, um, you can use this um, for this and you can also use them um, in other ways. And the teaching potential um, is given by using the sign lists, by using the readings and but the, the one thing that always needs to be done is, of course, is working with or, original inscription. There were some efforts in the past, for example, an introduction, introductory, introductory book to Maya hieroglyphic writing, a, and that only used um, standardized drawing, drawings, which do not represent the original spelling. So the thing is that um, if you if you want to um, to see uh, the, the the reading or the, the transliteration of a, a hieroglyphic text in our database, you can have both. You see the original original inscription with the with the reading provided by the project. And of course, the thing is that readings may change. There are some of course there are of course always discussions about the certain uh, the the uh, specific readings or decipherments. And we would like to, to, to give, the, give the users um, the possibility to comment all our work. So see that you can comment, are you sure with the reading of that and that sign? Are you sure with um, the decipherment of that text passage and so on? Mm -hmm. At the end, it's not, we're not creating a, a textbook to learn hieroglyphs, it's just um, uh, it's user friendly, so people can check what is the what is that what what what's written on that text, what's in there. So you can go with the you can go with your with your um, with your tel with your phone with your iPhone to the inscription and check the, our in, our database and see ah that's written on there. Because when I was when I was a, a bit younger, I always uh, always was in the museums and I I, uh, I thought oh I would like to read this hieroglyph this um, this Egyptian hieroglyph text here. So this is something we're creating for the future that people can use the database in order to, uh, to, to, to understand what's written on the monument I'm standing before. 
we we have Lee. Lee he has been waiting for a while. If you could please ask your question, Lee. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm just an amateur and I'm passionate about myoglyphs, so I've been following this for a while. Uh, first of all, amazing. Your project is it's so wide in scope and breadth and depth. And what I'm really impressed with is the fact that it's very scientifically approached. I mean, everything else has been heuristically, oh, this looks like this, so we feel like this, but you've got it really, really, uh, I'm mind blown. Um, well, I had a comment about the Unicode thing, uh, because there's this guy, uh, Carlos Palan, and he actually had a draft proposal to Unicode that the last I heard was mid-2019 or something. And I wrote to him on the, he had an internet email address and I wrote to him, but he hasn't replied about what the status is. Uh, the, apparently it's in draft status and it's progressing along. It's very different from your project, obviously. It's much more limited. Uh, he has these things called quadrats, right? Which he has all these little boxes where he's, and that doesn't capture, you know, even I can see as an amateur that that's not even going to capture a fraction of what you really need to capture. So I'm really, I'm dreading that that actually becomes the international draft, you know, standard. And <laughs> if it's delayed, so much the better. So you don't know what the status of that is, do you, Christian? No, I just know what is online, somewhere yeah. online. Okay. And he, he seems to have stopped working on it, you know, like, so maybe that's a good thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is, is there a recording, that, that this uh, presentation is being recorded, right? Because I've got friends like Claudia Zert in London, and yes. uh, Marie Bortset, and they would all yeah, love to I see this. So. Too, yeah. yes. It will Good. be on yeah. YouTube, on the Inscribe channel, and it's oh, live on Facebook at the same time, but we'll be editing it as well and reposting it on Facebook. So plenty of opportunities to see it again. Thank you, wonderful. And my last yeah. thing is, when are you publishing the English version of Neue Ergebnisse? Because a friend and I have been working for nine weeks, nine weekends in a row, two hours a, a weekend, translating into English because I want to share it with all my English friends, English speaking friends. And I speak a bit of German. He's a fully, he's a full time interpreter, native speaker of German. I know, I know, I know, I know. And we're working on it. And because the ideas in there are obviously what, part of what you presented today, but they're so brilliantly presented that I really wanted to send it to all my English speaking friends. So uh, <laughs> when is the English version coming? I know, Jorge. Um, the thing is that we could easily put it, post it online on the website, but I, I, I would really like to publish it uh, in, a, in, a, in a peer reviewed journal, mm -hmm. like Angel Mesamerica. But um, I know, I know, I, I, I know Jorge did a really great job, and it's, 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 it's something I, I can share the document. Um, yeah, you were right. It's, it's a very good thing that we could publish. Um, Don't worry. I mean, I'll, I'll forward you my copy when it's finished. We're about three quarters of the way through. We've got another four sessions, three sessions, I think. I'll send you a copy anyway and see what you can do with it. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, the thing is, um, I really would like to publish it, but some, some, some publications um, seem to, yeah, as a peer-reviewed peer journal is sometimes better. It's because the new systematic of my hieroglyphic that we discovered in my hieroglyphic writing is something which shouldn't just be published uh, as a blog. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. And we are, we are very happy with this kind of classification that we invented and or found and we didn't invent it. Of course, it's always a, that what, what you have to consider, this is always something et etic. It's not the emic classification of Maya writing. Mm -hmm. It's something yeah, that sure. we observe and think because the thing, what you need to consider, of course, is a hieroglyphic block um, was something organic for the classic Maya. It was sometimes, they, some colleagues say that it's it's living thing, but it was an organic thing where you had layers of hieroglyphs that one hieroglyph was 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 on the top of the other one and hiding the, uh, the some elements. It's so uh, this is the this is the real this is the real um, process that that happened. But in order to describe what, what you see, we use this approach saying, okay, there are vertical and horizontal um, um, partition in the side or segmentation elements that you can easily apply to, to other to describe the hieroglyphs. So, but um, if we have, up, we, by the way, we have, we have updated this 
paper. I can send you um, the latest version if you drop me a. If I'll drop, drop you a mail. Sure, thank you. Because we have added some other materials, and I will have to change some elements in there as to as well. I wanted to add more hieroglyphy examples. So, so I, I, my 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 thing is that it's now it's too long for for all the for the journals. With mm -hmm. all oh, you have to cut it down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Lee, for your question. I'm sorry, I didn't see that you had raised your hand uh, and I made you wait for a bit. Apologies. Uh, any no more problem. questions from the audience? Uh, yes, I would like to ask a question. Hi, Christian. Hi. It's, uh, it's me. Um, I, I've looked through the list of, the, of different catalogs. You mm. made a kind of correlation with, uh, with your new catalog. And uh, it seems that, well, I didn't see, probably I missed, uh, but I didn't see the um, last edition of Knorzov's catalog, which was published in Mexico in 99. So, uh, so you also have it, yes, am I right? Yeah, it's included. It was not, it was not, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we have everything. It's, it's, it's uh -huh. in there. I, I'm just thinking now of adding, maybe you, I don't know, what's your opinion? at Alex Santa Tokovinin's list. I don't know if this is something we should do. What do you think? Well, that's, that's, it, it, it doesn't have uh, any, any numbers, so it would be, yes. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, but I mean, the, the, uh, the catalog which was published in Scaret, so do you have it also, it's, it's, yes? It's completely in there and we, I can show you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so probably I missed. Thanks. There are even some unpublished catalogs from 1910. I, mm -hmm. I ordered them from the Smithsonian Institution. And they have the, one of the earliest lists of hieroglyphs that mm -hmm. was by, by Gute. I don't know. It's a Guth, Guth, Guthrie. Guthrie. It's something interesting, but it's not published. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Dimitri. Um, do we have any other interesting questions for Christian? If Anyone? I'm not blocking anyone, then I'll just have one little <laughs> comment. Uh, are you also recording like the silent glyphs, which are um, implicitly there, like when you have yuknom, very often you just have yuk, even, not even the no or the ma uh, in, in a lot of the things. Are you? I think there used to be an old convention where you put these curly brackets to show that that is just not written and it's silent. That would be very useful for learners, especially. I mean, experience it because they don't need it, but... No, it's, it's um, the reconstructions are in there, or underspellings, overspellings are, are, are encoded. Yeah. Miguel? Can I, can, I, can I ask one? Thank you so much, Christian, for this very refreshing and stimulating talk on so many levels. I had a lot of questions, but, sin but since there is the issue of time, I'll, I'll do just one, which is kind of technical, but I think it, it goes back to a, a problem that anyone working with an ancient script uh, undeciphered or partially deciphered has, which is what to do when there is a high degree of allomorphy and I was wondering, and I, I hope I didn't miss any details when you were talking about the catalog and the con concordances. Uh, I'm guessing you don't have uh, so many cases of uh, mergers because you are keeping uh, allographs separate in the catalog, if I understood you correctly. But I wonder what, what kind of choices are involved for you and criteria when you need to, ha to add a new sign or a new sign uh, form, a new allograph. Because if you, are, if you are basing your work on Thompson's list, then this involves having an alphanumeric label, which has a T and then I think four digits, right? Uh, what do you do when you have to assign a new label, a new number to, to assign? What, what are the choices involved? Yeah, that's a that's a it's a very good question. Thompson's original catalog has numbers from one to three hundred seventy, and from five hundred one to eight hundred fifty six, and then a category for head variants 
from 1000 to 1087 and another category of undefined signs from 1000 from 300 to 347 okay we what we do we um we corrected all the signs and we corrected this part of the catalog checking are there uh, misspellings are there doubles are there classification okay because we were, we were lucky to work with origin with the original gray cards of thompson's thompson so we could check where where's the original drawing of that of that sign that he is using his, in his catalog and this was very um very good work. it was very we were very, very happy that that the university of tubingen for um, um thomas bartel had a copy of the of the gray cards provided us with the with with all the 800 great cards as a copy and then i could check okay thompson drew this one and in, in his great card he, he he pasted up um drawings or, or, or copies of the specific original thing and i could recheck is this correctly done this is one part and then of course the the corpus of, of science is limited uh, according to thompson we just made the decision that we continue with sign numbering from 1,500 upwards, because we 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 don't we don't um, we 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 rejected many signs from Thompson catalog and we leave them. Uh, I can show you I, if I uh, if I can show you now the, the the operatory list that we are working on. It's online, and just let me open it. For, so. So basically, the new signs have a T plus uh, a digits kind no, of label. In our catalog, we use we don't use the T anymore because um, it's we 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 state it's it's from the signs one uh, one to one thousand three hundred forty seven. It, it's automatically T, and the new one is one thousand five hundred. With it, it's not necessary because we we, it, we made we made it public that it's that we are based. On and here, what I can show you right now is um, the catalog and work in progress. You see it? Yes. And you see here for the beginning. This is um, now the the catalog, which is um, in a, in a, in a in not public published really published. That is the working every time every time we have new signs for example, If we go down to the after. Um, here, it's the sign 1500 is the design cartouche, with or without this the thing here. And then we added new signs that we found in the corpus here. Again, you see here, this is the, uh, this is this T variant, and here this is with uh, this T variant with the beeper tight um, bottom and beeper tight um, horizontal. This one, so we are adding all, every, every time we find new um, and signs in the catalog, we are adding them to the list. And the list is not yet complete because um, at the very latest entry is 1,627. I, I could, I, I, at the moment, I didn't have any time to, to, to make the drawings. So at the moment, we added 125 new signs to the cat catalog. And every suggestion is welcome. And the thing is, um, in the in the in the sign in the sign catalog, we also um, have a um, a category to, to describe the signs, the iconographic origin of the sign. Because then then we um, my colleague Elizabeth Wagner, who is responsible for the iconography in the project, is um, saying, okay, this is this is anthropomorph, this is zoomorph. And so on and so on, and we go much more into the detail. And later, you can filter the catalog according to body parts, according to plant things, according to artificial things. And our ontology is based on uh, a basic ontological categories that uh, that are known from the cognitive sciences, where um, for people, for example, if, if you if you are a, a, if you are a young child. Everyone, when you're being when you're being born, you have a, um, a, 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 a cognitive um, ontological um, system in your head, which allows you to make the differentiation between 
a person, animal, plant, artifact, and the surrounding, the, the, the world around you. And this is something that you don't need to learn. You just know that this is different and this is different. And this comes from the cognitive studies. And these are the, the basic ontological um, categories that we are applying to describe the, the science. Is something person related? Is something artifact related? Is something natural environment related? And so on. And then we go delve deeper into the classification system. And that's the reason why we introduced, uh, we are using this workbench uh, vocabulary tool where we I can show you now it's different. Maybe I, I have to open it. I can show you how it works for the description of, 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 of science in Maya hieroglyphic writing. Let me check. Christian, after this, do you have time for one last question? Because I think there is one. I have time until a bit before seven. Okay. Open up now the, the, the vocabulary tool. Yeah, this is something, this is not, uh, the vocabulary work has not been done by, my, by, by me, but by my colleague, Elisabeth Wagner, who is the iconographist in the project. This, for example, is, uh, you, these are the basic categories for graph icons. Um, it's, it's, it's sorted in German, but you see the English and the Spanish version at the end. We make differentiate between um, age facet, artifact facet, orientation, property facet, sex, fa sex um, face and body markings, gesture and facial expressions, body part facet, landscape, human and animal facet. This is basically based on this um, um, based ontological categories. And if you, if you delve into the, into the diction, in the thing, then you, see, you make the different, different, you can granular, you can add here, is an, is an adult, adolescent, is it an infant, uh, elderly person, undetermined age, or the same with the artifact. Is the, is the sign belonging to the world of the architecture? Is it a bulk, is it a ball court? Is it a house roof? Is it a building platform, a, a scaffold and so on? So we already created this, um, um, this uh, controlled vocabulary to describe the signs. So we can attribute these elements to the signs and then you can sort them um, according to the things that you, that you want to search for. So the numbers are, uh, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the numbers do not reflect a specific order. It's just the, the, the work in progress order. And the sign catalog must be flexible. There, there must be uh, something. Uh, the, the most important thing is that the sign catalog must not be printed. The thing is, uh, as long as you print it and you put it to print, it's, 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 it's old. Yes. As long as long we have energy, we should. <laughs> Post, post online the things. But you think there will be a point in time when it can be printed? Yeah, sometimes we have to print it, of course, when the project is at the end. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Christian. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Christian. If I may, a very short question about allographs. Again, um, I'd like to ask, is this with variability in the look of the graphemes, at least partially explained by geographical and chronological reasons? I mean, can we group uh, allographs according to different regions and periods of use, or is not the case with the Maya allograph? I think this is, this is better a, a very good research question. When 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 the when the when the database is, is 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 going on its way, this is something to to have a look at it. I think it's it's a very good research question whether um, uh, what can what allograph they have chosen. As I told you, sometimes there are some the space is very off. The space and materials, for example, are sometimes um, the cause why specific sign variants have been chosen. Uh, when I was working with a very hard piece of jade from Nimi Punit, the scribe, so the, the, the carvel has chosen very easy sign variants 
because it's 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 that it's, it's a very hard material and for him it was quite quite um, difficult to in to 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 carve it with 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 um with very um calligraphic uh, calligraphically worked and science so the material very often determines the the, the allograph and of course the size of the glyph um, also does uh, is a is a matter but this is a very good research question and this is also should be uh, yeah oh. So thank you. The database will be a useful tool for this too, for these kind of questions, in order to ask these kind of questions. Yeah, yeah, we are, yeah. this is, thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, as predicted, you've had lots of very intelligent and interesting questions. I'm, I'm very happy that the discussion has been so lively, but I think it's now time to let you go and prepare for your next oh, yeah. meeting. It has been a, a true delight and honor, and I'm astounded by the level of quality and the multi-layeredness and connectivity of this incredibly sophisticated database. I can't wait to see the end results. And my, my big question was, what is next? But maybe in a different seminar and in a different setting, we will probe into the intricacies of what other objectives you may foresee for your future research and work. It's been fantastic. I think we finished this academic year's worth of scribos with a bang, really. It has been brilliant, engaging, stimulating, provocative, interesting, intriguing, and it has piqued my curiosity from day one. So I call this a real success for everybody, for joint research, cooperation, discussion. The thing that I was most proud of is the level of discussion that each seminar has sparked. And this is really a great achievement for joint research and collaboration. So Christian, we couldn't have finished with better um, successes, really. It's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. So all I have to do now is thank you. I'm told that we've had a few uh, technical glitches uh, with the Facebook streaming, but please be assured that all of our Scribble seminars are registered. They're recorded. You will find them online in our Inscribe YouTube channel. And they are on the website, Inscribe Invention of Scripts in the Beginnings, um, based in Bologna. So easily you can retrieve all seminars that are clearly all ready and user-friendly as much as Christian's database and his wonderful data, database uh, is. So wonderful to finish before our holidays with such a, a lovely presentation. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you everybody for being here. We will see you on the 16th of September, same Wednesday, always on a Wednesday afternoon, 16.30, 4 p.m. And we can't wait to see you all back here. Thank you so much. Bye bye, everybody. Bye, thank you. Thank you, Christian. We'll see you in January. See you in January. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Thank you. Have a lovely holiday if you take one. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Okay. I think we all need one. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye bye.